uh, no further ado, we're going to learn a bit uh, about a special hardware token. So please give me a warm welcome for Connor Patrick. Hello, thanks for getting up early and hopefully not drinking too much last night and coming to see my talk. So, uh, Solo is a open source uh, FIDO2 and U2F authenticator, security key. Um, I've been working on it since last year. I got into this space of um, security and hardware design a few years ago when I was still an undergrad. I went to my first DEF CON. I met a security rep uh, uh, a representative from Yubico. They gave me a YubiKey uh, shortly after I was setting it up with all my accounts. And you press the button, it spits out the string of characters most of you are probably familiar with. It's the Yubico uh, one-time password. Um, um, you know, I, I didn't really know much about security or how to make hardware work. And I was kind of looking for an educational product project to uh, to start on and, and learn. And I figured it'd be really cool to make my own YubiKey. Um, so looking into how these one-time passwords work, you plug it in. You plug your token into a website. You press the button, and that one-time password goes in to this website. Let's say like Google. Google will forward that to a, a Yubico server which validates the one-time password and lets Google know whether or not if it's authentic. And inside that string of uh, characters is uh, things encoded by the token, like a counter, a timer, a secret. And between the server and the token, there's a shared AES key, presumably um, set up at manufacture time by Yubico. And uh, this is definitely like a good secure thing to do, but if, if you're gonna make one of these, this isn't too attractive because now you have to set up a third-party server in addition to your hardware token that doesn't have anything to do with the service that you're authenticating to, like Google. And so that, that's kind of a pain. And also these one-time passwords can be phished, right? If, the, if Google was impersonated and get your credentials, they can also get that one-time password and use it to, uh, to take, take your account. Um, there's a little bit better protocol called U2F, Universal Second Factor. This is made by the FIDO Alliance, which is a uh, industry consortium that focuses just on making strong authentication for people to use, um, especially for the web. They have um, open specs for how U2F should work over USB, NFC, Bluetooth. They spec how the JavaScript APIs should be presented by the browsers for websites to use. They're all free. There's no third party servers involved. Uh, the documentation is really good. Um, I'll just give like a quick overview of how, how it works, very simplified. There's two steps, register and authenticate. So register would be done normally when you create your account or at a later time you add a second factor, you add a security key to your account. And then when you log in, this calls the, the register command. So when you uh, register a credential on your key, the website will send this request to your key. The browser adds another parameter to this request to the token, which is kind of like the hash of the domain, so like the hash of example.org or, or something. Uh, the, the, creden the key then generates a new key pair for this website to use and an ID to reference that key pair. It returns the public key back to the website. The website stores that and stores the ID as well. Then later when you log in, it sends a challenge, some random bytes to sign, the ID to reference the key pair to authenticate with, and then the browser adds that hash of the domain to the request as well. So the user gives consent, a token will sign the information and then you can log in. This hash of the domain is, I highlight, it's important. This is what makes U2F phishing resistant, really. If uh, you go to a phishing website, well, and you don't realize it, like example.org with like two E's or something, the fake example.org, this will be the hash of example.org with two E's. And the signature will be calculated over that. And so it won't uh, be any good for like the real example.org. And so even if you get tricked and you use your uh, authenticator, this signature is, is, uh, will be bad, it won't work. And so it's kind of on the browser to make sure that the API is uh, implemented correctly and that it can only be used on HTTPS websites. So uh, not long I kind of made my first hardware project, basically optimized for costs. It's very cheap. You can hand solder it. It has two main uh, important components. It's the microcontroller, which is the 
cheapest thing you can find on DigiKey or Mouser that has a USB support, and then a small chip to do the secu secure key storage and handles elliptic curve operations. Uh, I kind of decided to take this personal project and make an MVP or minimum viable product, which is, I guess, kind of business speak for doing the minimal amount of work needed to see if your business can work. Um, so I just ordered, to date, I've made about 6,000 of these tokens. Not all at once. My first order was probably about 1,000, 1,200, which is a bit risky to do since I just figured, like, yeah, maybe it'll work, and kind of got lucky. Um, shipped it to Amazon, used their fulfillment service. Uh, I spoke at ShmooCon 2017 about this and for a blog post if you want to look into it. Uh, it wasn't without its problems being the MVP, namely it's too cheap. It breaks, the button kind of sticks out, and if you carry around this around in your pocket on your keychain, inevitably the button will pop off. And if you are dedicated and you fix your button every time it pops off, eventually the, electron the electronics will wear down because they're exposed and there's no case. Um, there's only 16 kilobytes of flash on the microcontroller, so for just a sole U2F application, this is fine, but this is also an open source project, and one of the great things about an open source project is that you can iterate on it, you can add things to it with time, and if the U2F application takes up all 16 kilobytes of memory, then that's kind of lame. You can't add new features just because of the, the, the platform this is implemented on is um, full. Also, the microcontroller is an 8051 architecture, which is this embedded processor that Intel made back in the 80s. Uh, it's, I mean, pretty prevalent, but you don't really see people like using this in new designs very much anymore. It's not like you can buy or download a, uh, a GCC new tool chain to compile for this. It's a little uh, less fun, um, which also isn't great for an open source project, poor environment. Uh, also, uh, documentation is poor. I mean, there's a lot of good documentation online for how to use U2F and security keys in general, but I mean, I didn't add much to that. And so when people get referred to use a security key or a U2F token, they go to Amazon, they more often than not look for the cheapest thing they can get, and they find U2F0, they order it, they plug it in, and the, the, their accounts aren't secure yet, and they, they get frustrated. There's no instructions. And that's how you get one-star reviews. Um, so it's not really a finished product. Uh, meanwhile, there's FIDO2 and WebAuthn going on. FIDO2 is kind of the upgrade to U2F. U2F is very simple, and FIDO2 kind of adds uh, more, more features. It's uh, designed to be used as a password replacement, so you can authenticate using only public key cryptography if you want. And there's pin code support, so it can be locked, and when you enter, you enter the pin on the browser, which unlocks it, and you can use it for register authenticate. WebAuthn is a complete YW3 standard. It was kind of reached its final draft somewhat recently, so this is pretty new, pretty awesome. Really, its, its whole goal is to make public key, strong public key authentication available on the, on the web. Largely based on FIDO2 and other specs by the FIDO Alliance, they have some other things. Uh, you don't have to use an external authenticator. You can use the uh, TPM on your computer motherboard. Most, most have TPMs. Um, thanks to Adam Powers for making this graphic. It just depicts the current platform support for U2F and FIDO2. It's pretty good. Chrome has most support for Chrome on desktop and on Android has most support for U2F and, and FIDO2. Firefox just has U2F, but they're working on FIDO2 web off then. Edge has support for, Microsoft Edge has support for U2F and FIDO2. Um, uh, and re just recently, Apple started announced that they're going to support add support for their desktop browser Safari. No, no word yet on their on their mobile browser. I hope they will. Maybe if someone can hack Face ID, they might think about it more or something. Um, it's a quick demo for how passwordless could work. Just enter in your username to a website. Log in. Um, my authenticator was. Uh, locked with a pin, so you enter in your pin, one, two, three, four. Your authenticator will like have some sort of indicator indicating there's a request pending that you need to consent. So for solo, the light will change to orange, press the button, consent, that turns to green. 
and then you log in. That's it. And this is, you can even do this without even entering a username. You just plug in your token, press a button, and then that should be all you need to, to log in. How this works is there's more information stored along with the private key on the authenticator. Um, there's the RPID, which is just FIDO speak for that hash, the domain that gets added in the, to the request. Uh, user ID for the account, a display name for the user, and optionally a, uh, uh, a URL for, for, to represent the user to make an icon. So the, when you log in, the website will issue you a challenge. The browser adds the RPID or the hash of the domain. The token will look up, will look up by the RPID all the credentials it has created for that website. And one by one, it will sign each, um, sign the challenge for each credential and send the user information along with that. So then when the browser logs you in, it can first uh, give you like a menu of all the user accounts associated with this token in this website, and you just pick which one you want to log in as. And so that's um, kind, of, kind of a, a cool new way that you may be able to log into your, to your online services. So FIDO2 web is going on, non-ideal U2F0. In the back of my mind, I'm thinking, is it time to make a new security and like really like fix all the problems, and maybe make a finished product? Um, it, it's kind of hard to find motivation at this point and just like redo the project, busy with employment, not really sure if this would generate enough uh, revenue to self-sustain. How, how could I get funding to really start things off? Uh, it's also good, I say, to like show off your work. This can really help, whether if you're just gonna make a blog, or, uh, medium post, make a video, post on Hackaday.io, whatever it is, because when people work on similar things that you're working on, they're gonna Google things, and they're probably going to see your work and reach out to you. Maybe they'll help you, you'll help them. Inevitably, this will, can lead to finding new collaborators or even uh, co-founders. For me, this is how I met my team. Uh, Nicholas Stalder, he's based in Switzerland. He saw the U2F0 project, reached out to me on Twitter, said he wanted to get involved in uh, distribution in the EU and try to grow the project. It's great. Emmanuel Cecina, based in San Francisco, working on similar uh, uh, physical authenticator projects. Saw my work. We started exchanging ideas, decided we wanted to collaborate, and move on from there. Aiden Patrick is uh, my brother. He's in uh, business school, finishing his MBA. Figured, like, hey, for one of my classes, he can use like this solo U2F0 uh, as a project for one of his classes and maybe be a win win situation. So I say, sure, great. Um, I mean, today they've helped a lot, and it's, it's awesome to be able to have people to have feedback, um, improve on things that you aren't very good at, and split the work, workload with. Definitely couldn't have brought Solo to market without having a team. So time to make a new security key? Yes. Excited to go through with it. Um, so before you like go through the design, you should figure out what your hardware requirements are early on, and then uh, make a design according to that. First off, it should have a true random number generator, uh, basically so you can have a good source of ent entropy to generate your keys. Your keys should not be predictable. And there are a lot of microcontrollers that have this built in to the chip, whether if they have like a flip-flop bias between one or zero and they sample it with feedback, or a ring oscillator that's asynchronous to the main clock, um, other thing, they should have a lot more program memory. It's at at least 256 kilobytes. A lot, that's uh, more than enough to make U2F and FIDO2, and you have extra room for uh, future upgrades for the, for the project. Should, the microcontroller should be fast enough for public key crypto, so a little 8-bit microcontroller probably won't cut it or it could have uh, its own uh, built-in hardware acceleration for, for doing the crypto as well. Physical security features, this is a little hard to define. There's a lot you'll see on the market. Um, at the very minimum, it should have good locking me mechanisms for the flash or whatever the keys are stored. That way, if someone gets brief physical access to your key, they can't just connect something to it and read the flash. That would be, be, uh, that would be bad. There are other things that are nice to have 
Anything that adds anti-tamper resistance, side-channel resistance, fault injection resistance, that's good. It's kind of hard to find, um, I guess, on the, on, the, on the market currently. And of course, the FIDO application should be able to talk with the outside world, and we decided to target USB and NFC interfaces. And if we're trying to make a business, try to cost optimize, and so try to make it as cheap as we can without shortcutting any of our, our previous requirements. Uh, when you're trying to min-max all these uh, requirements and cost optimize, picking a microcontroller can be really hard. There's a lot of options. I'll just outline like four of the main ones that we looked at. Uh, so first one's pretty simple. There's a lot of microcontrollers that have a low feature set. They don't have USB or random number generator, but they have enough memory and they're low power. So it'd be good for working with NFC. I really like the AFM chipsets, but they don't have as much for security uh, as much as other chipsets, so we didn't really pursue this microcontroller or similar ones to it. The NRF52, this is a Bluetooth system on a chip that also offers NFC and Bluetooth, or, or NFC and uh, USB interfaces. This is a very popular chip in a number of products and in like the hacker and maker community. The processor is very fast, it has a lot of flash. I think this, it has a one, one megabyte of flash. But it's a little complex and expensive, and the NFC interface isn't um, ideal. It needs to be powered to be able to work, so you can't have a, um, a batteryless token that you tap on a phone and work. It won't be able to get power from the phone reader. Um, and adding a battery is uh, non-trivial, especially when you're trying to make a consumer product that adds a, a whole lot of other uh, issues to solve, and so we decided not to, to bother with this kind of chipset. The microchip SAM L11, this chip is really awesome. It uses the new like ARM M23, M33 cores, which are optimized to be used with ARM Trust Zone, which is the uh, kind of the secure architecture for making secure application, insecure application, um, have, have an extra layer of security isolation. Uh, these chips often come with like more physical security features. I recommend you check the data sheet and see. This is uh, kind of new and hard, hard to find. Has USB and a slow power. The the it, it set it was too bad though because it only has at most 64 kilobytes of flash memory, so we just couldn't go with it. Um, now, kind of in the middle is uh, the ST STM32 chipsets. They have random number generators, relatively fast, slow power. They have USB interfaces, and the the locking mechanisms for the flash are are good. They're decent, but uh, it's not much in terms of extra security features for like fault injection or, or um, uh, ant tam tamper resistance. And there, there, there was a recent presentation at, uh, called wallet.fail at CCC last December. They attacked not this microcontroller but a similar one, uh, STM32, that is the pro processor on the Trezor, the cryptocurrency wallet. They used fault injection to bypass one of the flash locking mechanisms and uh, dump the flash, get the secrets, um, is, which isn't too much of a, of a killer for us. I mean, yes, if someone has long-term physical access to a key, uh, they can potentially do some things to access the flash. Uh, but also, I mean, if they have access to your key, they can typically just use it. Um, so we decide not to worry about the physical security threat model too much. I mean, there's already, if uh, it's sec secure from malware on like a computer, there's gonna be no remote attacks. If someone picks it up in a coffee shop, there's, they, they can't connect anything to it to, to, to dump any sensitive information. And so we, we're, we're currently using this chip. Uh, it's enough space so we can add on extra chips to add the NFC capability. Uh, there's this uh, Austrian semiconductor chip, the AS3956, that offers a NFC type four interface, which is the EMV uh, NFC interface that you see on credit cards and is the same one that's used for FIDO authenticators. And this is great. It also provides an energy harvesting output, so it will take extra energy from the NFC reader field and you can power an external microcontroller from it. So this allows us to have a modular design where we use the same microcontroller and then for the NFC interface we can just add one extra trip chip and make it work. There are, I guess, 
better microcontrollers out there for this application. Typically, they are EAL certified microcontrollers. They've gone through this common criteria of security certification that's made by industry and governments. Um, these chips are intended to be used on secure identification, like government IDs and passports, IDs for banks, and even to be used on credit cards. And uh, generally getting like real documentation for these chips, like data sheets, you need to have like this weird like security clearance with the company to be able to access this information, or you need to be like a, a reputable, trustable company or government. government. Um, so people like me or us can't really get raw access to these chips and use them in their products. It, it's, they do have the USB and the, the passive NFC interfaces that could use, that would be great. And they have phys good physical security features. Um, the only option to be able to use these chips is to go the Java smart card route, where the vendors that make these chips um, get an operating system designed a Java smart card operating system that runs Java applets. And you use the documentation for the operating system instead of the, the documentation for the actual chip. And the, the functionality is you're, you're relying on the people that made this operating system for the chip. And so if there's new features that you want or that you need for your application, you're either out of luck or you need to employ the people that wrote this uh, operating system to add the feature for you. Or, and hopefully they'll, they'll even be allowed to do it. And so this is a uh, poor scenario to be in for a product developer, and we decided not to, to bother with this route. The secure hardware market is improving. Like I mentioned, the ARM M23 and M33 chips are, I guess, coming out. These chips that are designed to be with Trustone and vendors that are making these chips are probably going to add other physical security features with this, and they don't need to bother with the uh, uh, EAL uh, certifications. Microtrip Sam ML is one of them. There's another Taiwanese semiconductor company called Nuviton. They make a chip that's just like the Sam L, Sam L11. They have good security features and they have more memory. We were thinking about going with it, but at the time, it's the chip was still being released, and so it's a bit risky to uh, go with a chip that's just just coming out. We plan to upgrade in the future and have planned and have made our like code base easily portable, so that we can switch microcontrollers with. Not too much work. Uh, I made our prototype, hand soldered and 3D printed the case. We worked on having USB-A, USB-C options. The circuit is the same for all of them, just a different connector. Design is modular. Uh, uh, the, the thickness for the, some of the mechanical sizes for the different uh, USB-A and USB-C are different, and so to avoid having a different case for each, I decided to use a silicone case for all of them, so the, it'll just stretch over whatever small differences there are. Um, I guess to start planning our company, we enrolled in YC Startup School, or Y Combinator Startup School. If any of you have any interest in doing something similar, I really recommend checking out their lectures on YouTube. They go over a lot of great topics like finding your market, talking to customers, A-B testing. Um, a, a really common theme is all about doing the minimal amount of work to figure out if your product is worth something or is actually solving a problem, and then iterating from there. Um, for us, a great uh, avenue for doing this is using crowdfunding campaign like Kickstarter. Not only is it great to fund your initial production, but you can you find customers that you may not have originally thought of, and you can get great feedback to start iterating. And also, if it doesn't work, then you know to do something else. You can, you can set that like minimum goal that if you don't get enough funding, then you just don't do it. Uh, even like smaller things that we can do, you don't have to like make a full campaign. It's just like whatever content that you've made, post it, share it. If people like it, they'll sign up. Maybe subscribe for updates. Um, I mean, you don't want to like spam or anything, but if people are signing up and they like your content, then you know that's a good sign that you should continue doing what you're doing. Uh, after about maybe like a month or two, I guess, of sharing things online, we had around uh, 2,500 signups. Later, uh, we launched our campaign. Maybe after four weeks, we had over, just over 120k in funding. 
this is great. So we can do make, make a lot of the goals that we wanted to with this security key project. Um, we did experiment a little bit on our campaign. We offered, I guess, four main products. So there's Solo. It's just the security key with only a USB interface. Solo Tap, which is what we call Solo that has NFC added on in addition to the USB interface. Solo for advanced protection. This is kind of named after Google's security key program. You have a USB key and a, a Bluetooth authenticator that we got from a different vendor and paired them together. Solo for hackers, which is uh, just the same thing as Solo, but the device is unlocked, so you can reprogram it and uh, compile the firmware yourself or add new features. We don't uh, unlock all the keys for security reasons. Uh, after the campaign, over 95% of orders had at least one Solo in it. Over 60% of orders had a tap. Over 15% of orders had a hacker, and uh, not, not too many went with the, the Bluetooth option. Um, so I, I think these results are great. All of our people are definitely interested in all the products. I was really excited about the, the people expressing a preference for getting a hacker key. This means people are probably interested in compiling the code and maybe contributing to the open source project. So I'm really happy about that. Uh, we tested colors for the case. We had six different colors, black, white, red, green, blue, and transparent. Many people liked the color options. One use case we didn't think of is that people like to have different looking keys to use for uh, different, different things, different websites. It helps with our bulk order customization. People wanted to order, like, get a new color or get a, get a logo on a specific color, and this helped, I guess, uh, give, have bulk, order, bulk orders. Uh, we try to promote a lot during the campaign, of course. Uh, it's, when you have a crowdfunding campaign, it's hard to reach out to people and see if they'd be interested in like covering it in some manner. Typically, whenever you say Kickstarter or crowdfunding, that's an automatic red flag and people won't listen to you. But nonetheless, we had a lot of people that we didn't reach out to and saw the campaign and liked it and wrote about it, and this helped, helped a lot. So I guess if I were to do this again, I mean, I wouldn't, wouldn't bother trying try to even bother with PR, and hopefully it'll just come. There were a number of challenges that we faced. The hardest is that we definitely offered too many options. Every order, people could indicate a color preference. They want a USB-A or a USB-C connector. Whether or not they want a solo tap or a normal solo. So is that solo, should, should each solo be unlocked? Should it be a hacker solo? How many tokens do they want? Were people interested in getting a custom order? This turned into a pretty challenging scripting problem, pulling data from Kickstarter and surveys that we had and kind of coalesce all the data. And it's a lot more difficult to get everything right than we uh, originally thought. Uh, we definitely, we think we got most of our orders right. We definitely missed up uh, a few. And it, it, it's, it's challenging fixing people's orders after the fact. But we are doing it, for sure. Uh, for the production side, the boards aren't too complicated, just two layer boards, about 10 components, which is pretty small for a hardware project. The USB-C connector needs to be, I guess, have a special note on it because it is soldered on the top and bottom of the board, so that increases the cost. The manufacturer needs to basically solder the board twice, once for the top layer and then once again for the, the bottom layer. There are thickness requirements so that it plugs into your USB port correctly. Polarity, of course, of certain parts you need to stress that a lot. Um, it can be really expensive if your manufacturer puts the LED on 90 degrees the wrong way for all of your boards. Uh, we also ask for a conformal coating. That way, the electronics can uh, last a lot longer in environmental conditions. The conformal coating is just a thin epoxy layer put over the electronics. Uh, for the PCBs, we got quotes from many different manufacturers. Uh, ultimately, we decided on a, manufacturer, a contract manufacturer based in Hong Kong, in Shenzhen. Uh, we had a really good experience with them. Had a, it was really easy to open com communication and communicate our design constraints. And if they had any problems that somebody they were confused about or, or didn't foresee, they reached out to us, and it was really easy and transparent to get anything solved. 
there's a number of manufacturers that I've worked with in the in the past or I've started to work and I mean they, they aren't bad but I always have like this great experience with communication and um, relaying your design techniques and if there's like a problem or something you don't understand it'll just take uh, like m multiple days or even weeks of just email back and forth to be able to figure it out and that's not really a situation that you want to be in you definitely want to feel good about the uh, really the communication and the, the, the service that they're providing and minimize risk. Um, one of the things that we did is uh, make a, a uh, tester. So it's just a BeagleBone block that programs any slow that you plug into it with a, a test firmware, it exercises the light, and the, the tester will press the button to make sure the button makes good, good contact. This test that the microcontroller boots up, it's soldered correctly, the USB interface works, and if there's any, if it doesn't work, you have the option to do soldering rework on it, and that way, it's a, uh, you definitely want to have a tester and make sure that nothing was like soldered on backwards or anything. For the cases, another manufacturer in Sunjin, these are a lot easier, um, definitely, just make a design in your 3D software, prototype it on a 3D printer, uh, send the step file to the manufacturer, they can send you proofs. For us, we paid around $300. The samples we got were great. Uh, made a few design changes and then paid around $1,000 for the production tooling and ordered a lot of cases. We got a lot of cases because rather, rather than satisfying the color requirements for everyone's order, we just gave everyone every color. That just made it a lot easier for us, and so we had to, we had to uh, get seven times the amount of cases as we uh, needed. And so it was over 60 kilograms. This is just one of the boxes, one of the five that we got in the mail. And I don't know, it was kind of exciting. I never realized how heavy these would have been, even though each one is pretty light. And the shipping, we did everything ourselves. So we had all the inventory in place, and it was just a matter of printing out shipping labels and packing slips and going through people's orders, figuring out, okay, this person has an A, a C, or this person has two Cs, and just putting it in the mailer, sealing it, putting it in a large box, and when you're done, you take the large box and you take it to the post office. And it was very time consuming. Don't, would not recommend. This is my living room. I didn't clean up lots of boxes full of bubble mailers. For days, I was, I kept, stepping on like little sticky tape that you peel off from the bubble mailers. It was, it was everywhere for, for at least two weeks. Good thing I have good roommates. They didn't mind too much. Uh, it depends on what you're making. The, like if I, if I were to redo it, I'd plan ahead that and let the manufacturer do the packaging themselves and put a barcode on it. And then you just send that to a fulfillment center that knows how to pack things, knows how to scan barcodes and that'll make it a lot easier. I mean, it's a little bit risky when you do your first run because if there are any mistakes, then this can, you know, it's a, it's a bad cog in your, in your pipeline. So, Would it be possible to do a contract manufacturing in the United States as opposed to like Hong Kong and Canada? Uh, yes, uh, it's uh, it, it, interesting. There's not many contract manufacturers in the US that are good for these kinds of like low volume, small, small jobs like there are in other parts of the world. There, there is one that we eventually found, uh, Worthington Assembly in Massachusetts, that would be a good fit that we're looking at, at now. Um, it's hard. You need to have a lot more volume to make it economical in the U.S., unfortunately, but we are still looking at a lot of contract manufacturers. Um, so still, still more to go. We have another manufacturing run to do for our NFC models, we plan to start manufacturing for SoloTap soon. Thanks a lot to our backers and for being patient. We are still working and fortunately have another, another round of, of shipping misery to, to go through, but we'll do it. Our roadmap for the future, FIDO2 uh, U2F is, um, is what we have currently on our, our key implemented. We actually attended the interoperable uh, uh, functional testing event from the FIDO Alliance in, in Seoul. Uh, our key passes all their functional tests, and so we're almost ready to be certified with them. Uh, next, 
We're going to have static passwords, so you can use the key as a basic password manager soon. We also plan to add, I guess, what I'll call smart card functions, so that you can use the key for SSH and GPG and other encryption functions, similar to other security keys. And maybe in the future, we'll work on adding cryptocurrency functions to the, to the key. Um, our APIs are publicly documented online. They will also be available as extensions to the U2F and FIDO2 APIs, meaning you can access them from the browser and use other extra functions from the web, from JavaScript. Support for C and Rust. We're planning to rewrite everything in Rust. We want your help, so if you have any ideas or experience with any of this, or you want to contribute, come talk to us. We want your help. For the hardware, right now, it's just using the STM32 microcontroller, conformal coding, and the silicone case. Um, we, in the future, we'd like to move to one of the newer, secure, non-EAL microcontrollers. Perhaps use capacitive uh, touch sensing for the button and improve the casing to be more uh, tamper-resistant, more indestructible. Any ideas or feedback, please let us know. I uh, also want to talk about the bootloader. Uh, so there's 256 kilobytes on the flash. Uh, the first part of it, we have our own bootloader in there to support signed firmware updates. So if we have any new features, um, we, we can rebuild using the deterministic build process, post the release, sign the release, and then post it to GitHub, and people can upgrade all their keys. If you don't want this, you can disable it. Also, if the key is unlocked, if it's a solo hacker, you have access to use the ST bootloader, which is a ROM that's on every microcontroller that's not made by us, it's made by ST. And uh, you can use this to reprogram your device from scratch. So if you don't trust the keys that we have, you can just make, the, make your own root, root of trust. Cool. Um, developing for Solo is really easy. All you need is a USB port. The software tools, is you just need the ARM compilers from the, the GCC compilers from ARM, uh, make program, make file, and Python. We have our own Python program to program the keys, and it works from Linux, OS X, or Windows. And our documentation is all online right now. I mean, I'm, I'm using just my USB port to do firmware development. This is a picture of me working on the firmware for Solo Tap with a non integrated antenna. If you're interested, you want to try FIDO2 or U2F. You want to develop your own secure application? Again, let us know. Also, come talk to us after the talk. We have a lot of keys that we can hand out, a lot of um, unlocked hacker devices that you can program. So come see us. Um, now, I'll take questions. So, everything's Yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, we just made a shipment to. Amazon, you can go to our shop. We have a discount code. And if you want to buy them, they're online. Um, got a question for how did you monitor that? How did you monitor manufacturer quality? Uh, yeah, that's, that's tough. I mean, the, the main thing is to use the, the tester. This func uh, makes sure that all the, the functionality is there. Um, I guess for the, for the cases, all we did was do, use the samples and kind of hope that the production samples that they send after that are just as good as the samples that they sent us. Um, yes, yeah, so the programming wasn't done in, um, in the factory. After we got the shipments, we did the programming and the, the testing of the programs ourselves. And I guess if there were any uh, hardware modifications, it, I mean, it's just a two-layer board, it would have been very, very obvious to, to see. Yeah. So, so as you scale, um, you probably won't be able to teach lots of these yourself. Have you considered anything up for a zero trust manufacturing floor or otherwise sort of, I guess you'd have to really move to a secure micro that would take, if you were doing a signed move loader plus that initial firmware load, right, giving that sign from a root of trust that's already in that secure micro would be really key. Um, yeah, yeah, it, it, it's challenging. I guess for our, our next step, we'd like to use, I mean, have them programmed by someone nearby, someone that we can drive to and, and trust, give the firmware files to them to program a large set of chips. And um, 
use that. Uh, we haven't looked too much into like, zero trust manufacturing um, or other programming options for new secure chips. So looking at that. Thanks.